Hey, good morning, everyone. Good to see all your smiling faces here. Welcome to Sage Hills Church. We are so, so glad that you're with us today. If you're a guest, we want to welcome you and say thanks for joining us. If you're joining us online, no matter where you are, thanks for being a part. And if you're listening throughout the week, we are so glad you're keeping up with what's happening here at Sage Hills. Uh, this week, we are in week four of our series, Released. And we're talking about things that we've been released from and what we've been released into uh, as we study the book of Galatians together. Um, this week, uh, I had a very close call where I was going to be needing to be released from jail. And so let me tell you this story. I, um, I hiked Saddle Rock on a Thursday morning for a sunrise hike. My a friend of mine told me, you got to try it. It's incredible. So woke up early in the morning, which I, I wake up about 4.30 every morning. But I got up this morning and I started hiking up Saddle Rock, pitch black, right? I get to the top. I watch the sunrise, have a time of prayer and worship. I'm by myself up there. It was glorious. I just left feeling so full of the Lord and His Spirit. And I began walking down. And as I was walking down, I saw a friend of mine in the distance. His name is Mike Abbott. He goes to our church. And I knew it was Mike because I, I, you know, I've coached soccer with Mike. I've been around him enough. And he was all bundled up. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to scare Mike because we're the only ones on the hill. He's going to love it, right? And so I, um, I hide about uh, right, at, right at the top there. There's a tree right before you make your way up, up to the top. And so I have my dog. His name is Marshawn. He's sitting right here with me. And we're high, not because I like the Seahawks or Marshawn Lynch. I have a son who's a, never mind. Okay, so anyways, we're hiding behind the tree and we're quiet and Mike walks right in front of me and I see him and right as I just begin to jump, like I'm going to frighten him, I realize quickly, this isn't Mike. And I mean, get this context, right? It's like, it's like 7 a.m. in the morning. I mean, it's still just dusky out. And I am, Aah! and my dog is right there. And this guy, Mike, <laughs> he runs up the hill. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. And my dog chases him. So, sir, if you're watching, if you go to our church, I'm so sorry. He, I never got to tell him I was just playing. Like, he was gone. Uh, way faster than I was, so we can all just thank Mike Abbott for having a twin. Uh, anyways, so uh, there, we ca there, there are times in our life where we find ourselves needing to be released, and uh, there were three different eras in the church where the church needed to be released from slavery into this concept of sonship, and that's what we're going to learn about today is how we can make the shift from slavery to, to sonship so we can be released from the law of sin and death and into the law of grace and life. And so we're going to be in two places in scripture today. We're going to jump in at Romans chapter 8 verses 14 through 17, and then we're going to go through Galatians chapter 4, and I'm going to tell you right off the bat, we're not going to get through all of Galatians chapter Chapter 4. I'm going to do my best, but most likely not. So we'll get as far as we possibly can, and it'll be a delight to get into God's Word together. So I would ask that out of reverence for God's Word, you stand to your feet at this time. We stand to our feet to honor God's Word and the reading of that at the beginning of our time as we jump into the Apostle Paul's letter to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. It says this, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs with God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. Would you read verse 17 beginning with the word now? Ready? Read. Today, church, my challenge is for you and I, led by the Spirit of God, to make the shift. Make the shift from slave 
to sonship. Make the shift from slave to sonship. And we're going to talk about how we do that together, but let's pray together. Father, we want to thank you together for your word this morning. Lord, we're grateful that Paul, when he wrote the book of Romans and later wrote the book of Galatians, he wasn't just talking about two churches that existed way long time ago. Lord, these words are applicable to us here today. And so we are asking you, Holy Spirit, speak to us today through your word, so that we can be the sons and daughters of God that you've called us to be. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said together, amen. Amen. Hey, turn to your neighbor before you're seated and tell him, make the shift. (laughs) Making the shift today. That's what we're doing. We're making the shift today. We are going to be talking about Galatians chapter 4 this morning. We were in Galatians 3 last week and we'll be in Galatians 4 this week. And we're talking about this shift that needs to occur in the life of every believer. It's a shift that Jesus paid for. It's the shift to sonship. And when I say sonship, I want you to understand something. The Greek word for son uh, is all-encompassing. Remember in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, we learned last week that now there is no longer male nor female, Jew nor Greek, male nor female. So when we use the word sonship, I want you to know, daughters of the king, I'm talking to you as well. I'm not just talking to the men. Um, And, you know, I was thinking about it this week. I was like, what if I, instead of sonship, I said daughters? Would the men be able to associate with daughters? And the truth is we probably wouldn't. Our, 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 our world that we live in is very misogynistic. We are very male-centered. But I want you to know something. Jesus didn't just die for men, okay? Like, he also died for the other 50% of the population that are females. And his spirit is the great equalizer that male-female hierarchy has been reversed as a result of the cross. And we celebrate that at St. Jill's. The full benefits of the cross of Jesus Christ, we want to celebrate. So daughters of the king, we love you and we're glad you're with us and we're not just talking to the men today. So we're going to make the shift from slavery to sonship today beginning in Galatians chapter 4 verse 1. We'll jump in together. This is what the apostle Paul writes to the church of Galatia. He says, what I am saying is that as long as an heir is under age, he is no different from a slave. Although he owns the whole estate, The heir is subject to the guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were under age, we were in slavery. Everybody say slavery. Slavery. Under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons. God sent his spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So, so are you, so, so, excuse me. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you an heir. God has also made you an heir. Church, I want to explain something to you today from Galatians 4. God did not make you a slave. He didn't make you a slave. When he liked the idea so much of you that he put skin to it, he didn't create you with the idea that you would live under the yoke of slavery. God's spirit has brought about the freedom that you get to experience. The Bible says that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And for the children of God, especially at this time in the book of Galatians, There was this gravitational pull that we've been talking about for the last three weeks. Christ had paid for their freedom, and and who the Son sets free is free in, right? And so God had paid for their freedom, and so they're supposed to walk and enjoy their freedom, but there's this gravitational pull that is pulling Israel back into the practices of the law, which would only further their slavery, not their freedom. And so Paul writes this letter to church in Galatia in chapter 4, and in chapter 4, he's wrapping up the first part of the book of Galatians, and that was his rebuke to the Judaizers. He's wrapping up his rebuke to the Judaizers, and he's saying, listen, when we were under age, 
When we were underage and we were living in a house, and he's, he's telling a story, right? Imagine that, you're, imagine that you are the son of the king, and you're living in a house, and there's slaves in your house. Until the time set by the father, the slave's children and your children are on equal playing ground. Equal playing ground. But when the set time has come, there will come a moment when you are no longer identified as just a child who's equal to slaves. There will be a set time in which, and in most cases, it's at the death of the father, that you become the ruler of the house. In other words, you receive the power that your name is due. There will come a time. And what Paul is arguing in Galatians chapter 4 is that time is now. That the death benefit of our father, Jesus, has come. And so we are no longer on equal playing ground to slaves. We've been set free from slavery and into sonship. And so we need to make the shift. Someone should say amen to that. (laughs) We need to make the shift from slavery to sonship. And I'll share with you why. As children of God, I want you to know something Paul ends Galatians chapter 4, verse 7, at least this first chunk of it, with this promise that Jesus has made us an heir. Everybody say heir. Heir. Not in heir. He made us a heir. And this concept of heir brings about this idea of inheritance. What Paul the Apostle is saying is that as children of God, you have something to look forward to. And this directly, directly affects this concept of slavery, right? Because in slavery, you don't have anything to look forward to. Am I right or wrong? You don't have anything to look forward to. Let me, let me put it to you this way. Okay, so at two different times or two different periods in Scripture, the children of God found themselves in slavery. The first one was in Egypt. Everybody say Egypt. Egypt. You have to excuse my handwriting. It's beautiful, I know, but um, I'm a fourth grade boy when it comes to calligraphy. Okay, so Egypt. So if you want to know the story of how the children of God became slaves in Egypt, you'd have to go to the book of Genesis chapter 45-ish, and you would find the story of a group of brothers who sold their brother Joseph into slavery. And when they sold him into slavery, a great famine came into the land of Israel. Egypt purchased Joseph. Joseph became high in rank in in Egypt, and his brothers who sold him into slavery actually had to come to Egypt, be subject to him, and because they had done a good job storing up in good times, Egypt actually took possession over all of Israel, and Israel, the people of God, found themselves in what? Slavery. And they were in slavery for 430 years. Was this God's plan? Probably not. God did not want his people to be subject to slavery. God wanted his people to be sons, but they found themselves in slavery. And while in slavery, this is a slavery cycle. It starts with, everybody say slavery. Slavery, Slavery, right? And then slavery, these couples, they would have children, and guess what their children would have to look forward to? What? Just because they weren't born of You know, they weren't born into freedom. They were born into slavery, so they only have slavery to look forward to. And guess what? The next generation, what happens? Slavery. It's a slavery cycle. Slaves begat slaves, begat slaves, begat slaves for 430 years until Exodus. In the book of Exodus chapter 1, the Bible says that God spoke to his servant Moses and said that the cries of my people Israel have reached me. And then the the Bible says, so so this is Moses' era, Everybody say Moses. Moses. So we have the people of God still in what? Right? So they're, they're still in slavery. But God sends this great emancipator named Moses. Everybody say Moses. Moses. Right? God sends Moses. And why did God send Moses? Starts with an F, ends with an E. Thank you. He sent them to bring freedom to these slaves. He sent them, but as Moses began this process of freeing Israel from their sin, he, God and Moses together realized the people of God have lost their way. They've lost their way, and they, they don't even know what it looks like to live as a son any longer. They don't even know what it means, and so God and Moses released this thing called the law. Everybody say the law. 
And so God releases the law to Moses, which was supposed to further their understanding of what it meant to become a child of God. It was, it was behavior that was befitting to a child of God. The law revealed that. But here's what happened. The law and Moses, which was supposed to bring about their freedom, actually brought them to become what? They actually became slaves. Now, they're no longer slaves of Egypt. They're slaves under the what? They became slaves under the law. And the reason for this is slaves, they always begat other slaves. And they didn't have the ability to break out of this cycle of slavery, so they continued in this slavery. They continued in this slavery for 1,680 years. That's a long time. 1,680 years, they began, they just kind of continued the people of God in this vicious cycle of slavery unto the law, trying to keep all of its ordinances, trying to protect it and hold it up as strong as they could until the era of Jesus. Everybody say Jesus. Jesus found the people of God once again in slavery. Jesus dies on the cross. He sets people free from the law of sin and death. How did Jesus set the people free from the law of sin and death? Not by disregarding the law of sin and death, but by fulfilling the law. And when he set them free from the law of sin and death, he promised them sonship and not slavery. He promised them freedom. But after Christ ascended unto heaven, the people of God still recognized who Jesus was, and they thought that, well, maybe Jesus was just the intro into the kingdom, that the cross was really just an idea of behavior modification. So Christ became the people of God's entry into heaven, but the law, once again, became the sustaining grace that they needed. And Jesus, through the apostle Paul, is charging the Judaizers, saying, the cross is more than just behavior modification. It's life alteration. So Paul is challenging them. And you might wonder, why is so Paul so passionate? Because he sees this over 1,700 years of history of the people of God constantly reverting back to slavery, constantly finding a way to find themselves under the yoke or the power of something that is other than the Lord Jesus who died for their freedom. And so Paul is saying, make the shift from slaves to sonship. Because slaves... The only thing they have to look forward to, ooh, say chills cup right there. You see that? <laughs> Maybe the Seahawks should pick me up. I got good hands. <laughs> but the point is this. Slaves only have slaves to look forward to. Slaves only have slaves to look forward to. And that's why when you're making the, sli- the shift from slaves to sonship, you have to understand something. Slaves are slaves. Slaves are slaves, but children and children of God, they have a hope. And that hope is that if slaves are slaves, children of God are heirs. Children of God are heirs. The freedom that Jesus brought about in this slavery cycle, it broke us out of this place. It changed completely our identity, right? The cross of Jesus Christ is no longer just this idea of behavior modification. It's life alteration. It takes you from slave to son or daughter in the king, and you have to make that shift. And when they made that shift, they understood that when they made the shift from slave to son, they became heirs. Paul said, co-heirs with Christ. And can I share with you today, beloved of God, that as heirs in Jesus Christ, co-heirs with Christ, we have something to look forward to. We have something to look forward to. And what we have to look forward to is dualistic. It's too strong. The first thing that the children of God have to look forward to is as children of God, we have hope in death. We have hope in death. You know, it's why every time I get the opportunity to be in the room with a saint who crosses from death to life, there is such incredible peace in that room. And do you know why there's such incredible peace in that room? Because as children of God, we have hope 
in death. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 4 says, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Someone say amen. amen. And into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Beloved of God, there is more to life than what meets the eye. There, when, when, for us, as Jesus, for those who follow Jesus, we get to, when we die on earth, we get to walk into an eternal reality where moth and rust and dirt and dust don't destroy. Where the Bible says in the book of Revelation that he wipes every tear from your eye. Where hope is no longer a hope so, it's a I know so. Where you, where you present yourself fully in the presence of the living God, heaven is amazing. And for believers in Jesus, it gives us a hope that takes us through tough stuff in life. It doesn't mean that stuff in life is, gonna, is always going to be easy. But it gives us a hope. And it's the hope of heaven. So while we live on earth... Why we live here on earth, earth is not our final destination. We live in the hope of our inheritance that is to come. And while it might get tough, we don't turn our back on the tough stuff. We look forward to the idea of our inheritance being made whole in heaven. So the first thing is children of God have hope in death. I love what Billy Graham said. He said, for the believer, there is hope beyond the grave because Jesus Christ has opened the door to heaven for us by his death and resurrection. As believers in Jesus Christ, as children of God, we have hope in death. But can I tell you that's only half the story? That's only half the story. And many believers in Christ live as though the only hope they have in their life is that one day they're going to die. For much of the church, this is how people live. They're like, well, you know, it's going to be always terrible here, but one day I can only imagine. <laughs> Beloved of God, you don't have to only imagine. You don't have to only imagine. Believers in Jesus Christ, why they have great hope in death, I want you to know something. Children of God have power in life. It's dualistic empowerment. It's a hope in death, but it's a power in life. God did not come send his son to die on the cross so you could have a glorious death only. <laughs> He died on the cross on your behalf, and when Christ died, you died. When his spirit eked out onto humanity, you received a power in life over death. Oh, come on, somebody. This is a good word. I promise you this is a good word. The Bible says in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 7 through 8, he said to them, it is not for you to know the time or date that the Father is set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, till the very ends of the earth. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war, war the way the world does. The weapons we fight with not the, are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Believers in Jesus are not passive pansies. I'm serious. Like for so long we've painted this picture and I'm guilty of it. That we just have to sit back and allow the enemy, well, he, he's the prince of this world. He gets to do whatever he wants. Let me explain something to you. He might be the prince, but my daddy's the king. And it's time for believers in Jesus to take their authority, their authority. Listen, some of us need to be reawakened to the Holy Spirit that is inside of you. The Holy Spirit has been released. When you accepted Christ to be your Savior, you were filled with the Holy Spirit. But some of you need to activate that spirit and kick some demon's booty. That's what I'm saying today, church. Like, we need to come back to that place where we just say, look, we know who we are in Jesus. I don't want to be anything more or anything less than all Christ died for. I want it alive in my life. And let me just share with you, that shouldn't be controversial. That's the gospel. 
That's the gospel, the fullness of God in our lifetime because he broke the curse of slavery. You can do it, church. You have all that you need to be who God called you to be. It's not just hope and death. It's power in life. And that's why Paul is reminding the church at Galatia, don't go back to this. Don't go back to this. You've been set free from slavery. Slaves don't have anything to look forward to, but sons do. Sons have something to look forward to. They have hope in death and power in life. So, beloved of God, I want to challenge you today. Make the shift from slave to sonship. Sonship is so much better. Can I just share with you? I spent much much of my life as a slave to sin. I allowed sin to have the power over my life. I tapped out and just hoped for a day that, oh my gosh, one day God's going to set me free from it, probably not until I die. But can I just share with you? Sonship is so much better. Sonship isn't the idea that sin is completely gone. It's just that the idea that sin is defeated. (laughs) And you get to walk in the victory of the cross. Everywhere you go, you get to walk in the victory. You don't have to worry about sin anymore. Why don't you have to worry about sin? Because love wins. (laughs) You spend all of your time thinking about how I can love and love better rather than how I can keep on sinning and being like Eeyore stuck in a garden eating worms. Christ came to set us free from the law of sin and death so that you and I could be grace-filled, love-filled sons and daughters. And so I'm just challenging you, just like Paul challenged the church at Galatia, don't look back to slavery's yoke. Be set free by the blood of the Lamb. Amen? Amen. Let's jump back into Galatians chapter 4, verses 8 through 20. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slave to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, is anybody excited that they're known by God today? Like, wowzers. I mean, come on. Like, we represent the people who are known by God. Whoo, that's a good word, man, right there. That's powerful. Um, But you're known by God. He says, but now that you are known, now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You're observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I may have wasted my efforts. Paul is just getting real right now with these folks. He's getting real with them, church. And I want, to pay, I want you to pay attention to Galatians chapter 4, verse 8. Um, Paul is discussing this group of the church in Galatia that um, are falling prey to Judaizers, but he's referring to a certain section of this church, and these are the Gentiles, right? This group of Gentiles who, who were prior to the cross of Jesus Christ in the mind of all of Israel, they were not allowed to be part of the children of God. And Paul is reminding them that before they knew the true God, they worshipped other gods that were not really gods at all. We call this pagan worship. We call this pagan worship. Paul is essentially saying, formerly when you did not know God, you were a pagan. And then... He connects that pagan worship in verse 9 with, but now that you know God or known by God, how is it that you are turning back to these miserable forces? Paul was not referring to these Gentiles returning back to paganism. What he's referring to is they're turning back to the law. The interesting thing here is Paul is getting very chippy. He's getting chippy with these Judaizers. He's saying that paganism and law observant are the same thing. Could you imagine if you are a grumpy religious person hearing the Apostle Paul equate paganism with law observance? Paul says, yeah, they're the same thing. You know why? Because they both result in the same fashion, slavery. Pagan worship and religiosity all equate to the same thing, slavery. One is under slavery to these false gods. The other is in slavery to a law system that's already been filled in a bygone era. 
They both result and turn into the same thing. I just had to note that. I just thought that was so interesting, Paul getting so chippy. Pastor Paul right here telling him how it is. Jump back in with me with verse 12. He says, I plead with you, brothers and sisters, become like me, for I became like you. You did me no wrong. As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. And even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Jesus Christ himself. Where then is your blessing for me now? I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn your eyes out and give them to me. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth. You know what's so interesting, beloved? The truth isn't as popular as it should be, is it? <laughs> the truth isn't as popular. Truth is divisive. <laughs> Why is truth so divisive, beloved? It's divisive because it demands you to either accept it or deny it. And when Paul was beginning to bring truth to the church at Galatia, they began to reject it for a bygone era. And Paul said, listen, you were so kind to me at once. When I, when I originally introduced you into the freedom that Jesus offers, you were so kind to me. But now you've been lied to and you are beginning to allow the lies to trump the truth. Can I just tell with you something, church? Slaves believe lies that result in bondage. Can I just tell you that lies are the tools or the contract the enemy uses to put you back into slavery? If I could create a spray that would result in everyone recognizing lies, I would create that spray. I just wish I could walk around with believers all day long and tell them, hey, that's a lie, don't believe it. Hey, that's a lie, don't believe it. Hey, no, 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 don't go there, don't go there, that's a lie, don't believe it. Trust me, because the moment you begin to hear a lie and agree with the lie, the enemy then has a contract. He has a contract with you that's based on a lie and which pays bondage in slavery. You might say, well, Mike, what lie am I believing? Anything that's spoken over your life that doesn't result in freedom is a lie. Anything, any, anything that you believe over your life or has been spoken over your life that is less than God's story, God's narrative for your life is a lie. When I was in fourth grade, I had a fourth grade teacher throw a desk at me and tell me my life would never amount to anything because I talked too much. <laughs> Mr. Wilding, I'm getting paid to talk now. <laughs> That's an example of how those little lies sneak themselves in. And I want you to know something. Those lies can begin to shape into realities that we allow to trump truth in our life. And here's what I want you to know today, that if you are a beloved believer in Jesus Christ, you need to understand something. As you make the shift from slave to sonship, slaves believe lies that result in bondage. Children of God believe truths, and they trust truth that results in freedom. Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. Believe the truth, deny the lie, cling to the freedom that is found in Jesus Christ. And remember this truth this week, beloved, who the Son sets free is free indeed.